the flickering shadows softly come and go. It was on June the 16th, 1904, a Thursday, that a young Dublin man went on his first date with a young Galway girl. That man was James Joyce, and the woman, Nora Barnacle. Their date looked up down to Ring's End and to Sandy Strand, and whatever transpired between them on that date left a lasting and indelible impression on Joyce. Indeed, when he came to write his masterpiece, June the 16th was the day on which the entire plot of Ulysses unfolded. Many years later, Nora confided to a friend. Ah, sure, that was the day I made a man out of Jim. Ulysses is widely regarded as one of the greatest novels in English literature. Let Stephen Fry tell us about the book. It's the retelling of Homer's Odyssey great first epic, really, after the Iliad, the greatest story ever told. And it's told in one day in Dublin on the 16th of June. And instead of Ulysses, this great Greek hero, there's this little Jewish man called Leopold Bloom and his wife Molly. And it's the search for uh, a son he never really had in the same way that Ulysses searches for his son in the original. If your English is good enough, read it, and you'll be astonished by how beautiful it is. And so... Leopold Bloom, a wandering Jew seeking the sun he never had, meanders through the streets of Dublin. Sculptor Robin Buick's famous bronze plaques act as pointers to the route taken by Bloom in the novel. On June the 16th, 1954, the 50th anniversary of the events in the novel, a group of men decided to organise a day-long pilgrimage, visiting all of the places mentioned in Bloom's wanderings. They included John Ryan, Anthony Cronin, Patrick Kavanagh, Tom Joyce and Brian O'Nolan, each of them representing a character in the novel. However, the pilgrimage had to be abandoned halfway through when the participants succumbed to inebriation at the Bailey pub which Ryan owned. The whole episode was an interesting historic echo to the celebration of the book in Versailles in 1929, when Joyce himself and Samuel Beckett got thoroughly pied. That first public celebration of Bloomsday in 1954 in Dublin was the forerunner to what has become an international celebration. So what goes on on Bloomsday? Well, in Dublin, some people dress up as characters from the novel. Some just in period costume. There are breakfasts and afternoon teas. There are readings from the novel. I'd love to have a long talk with an intelligent, well-educated person. I'd have to get a nice pair of red slippers like those Turks with the feds used to sell, or yellow. Stately plump Buck Mulligan came from the stairhead, bearing a bowl of lather on which a mirror and a razor lay crossed. A yellow dressing gown, ungirdled, was sustained gently behind him by the mild morning air. <laughs> Inevitably, there are pub crawls. There are walking tours, recitals. There are discussion groups, impromptu street performances, reenactments and drama. To those who find the novel obscure and difficult to read, Senator David Norris, who played a key role in Bloomsday's revival, says that the book should be read aloud, and then the text comes to life. A bit like music, I suppose. Bloomsday is a unique tribute to the genius of Joyce. 
It's celebrated all around the world, from Moscow to Malta, from Beijing to Buenos Aires, and from Cape Town to Chicago. Think about it. There isn't an International Hamlet Day. There isn't a War and Peace Day. There isn't even a Great Gatsby Day. There is, however, a Bloomsday. Make a note in your diary. June the 16th, and come and spend a delightful day in Dublin, celebrating and enjoying the festivities. There's singing and dancing and posing and prancing. There is re ra and rula bula. It's a truly enjoyable day. As Joyce himself might have said, Ah, sure, it's all great gas. (laughs) 